In a CBC learning curve and participation report published in 2022, there was a huge dip in the level of measuring how active children were. Sure, the lockdown was mostly to blame, but when the outdoor environment has nothing but this, I bet no kids want to be outside and stay active. The report I mentioned at the beginning of the video pointed out a very alarming statistics. Only 37% of children under the age of 17 moderately and adequately participated in physical activities, which is indicated by the report as at least 60 minutes daily. Wait, it get worse. Only 17.5% of children aged 5 to 11 and 11.6% of those aged 12 to 17 exercise adequately enough. The research also pointed out that only 25% of children and youth aged 5 to 17 achieve more than 2 hours per day on average of total time engaged in indoor and outdoor unstructured play. One interesting point from here was, these data were reported for October 2020 when the lockdowns were not as severe and strict as the initial ones in March and April 2020. And if that wasn't interesting enough, the low rate of physical activity among children had been low since before the pandemic. Not during, not after. Here's a news article from The Globe and Mill 12 years ago stating that only 12% of children, 1 in 8, were getting enough exercise, which was at least 90 minutes per day at the time. The standard was quietly changed to 60 minutes a few years later, but the rate remained low, below 50%. From 35% in 2014 to just 24% in 2018. Although the number of participants was small, only a thousand, this research adequately described how inactive children were. All of these statistics make this question, what is the leading cause of this if it's not the pandemic? If you want to answer this question yourself without watching the rest of my video, just pause it and go for a walk in your neighborhood. If you already did that and now came back to resume the video, yes, the answer is the lack of adequate public spaces or green spaces. We have stopped building neighborhoods for children half a century ago and instead built neighborhoods and residential areas with just single family homes and nothing interesting within the walking distance from these homes. Children can no longer safely walk to school unless their houses are next to or opposite to school and parents absolutely don't feel safe about allowing children to go to school to convenience store down the street, or even to their next door neighbor or friends, all because of how neighborhoods and streets were designed. You might have seen signs like this in some neighborhoods in your city or places you visit. That's right, it is the people hostile and car centric streets that not only cut children off from accessing facilities that contribute to their physical and mental health, but also restrict them from having any independence or freedom of mobility. Many cities have beautiful facilities and walking trails for children and people to enjoy, but since they need to be driven, it slowly defeats the purpose of staying active, and accessing them feels like a task rather than a recreational activity or a short walk. It is very ironic that some people have to drive to go for a walk, because where they live, they cannot do that even when they want to. But even when spaces for children are available, they lack fundamental functions to ensure children can have fun or enjoy physical activities with their peers. This is a big problem in winter cities when the outdoor infrastructures are often claimed to be too cold that no one uses them in winter. This is just an excuse for the poor maintenance because isn't it ironic that while many playgrounds are abandoned almost all winter, outdoor skating rinks and hockey rinks are still highly active and children aren't even allowed to have indoor recess unless it's below minus 26 degrees Celsius? While some outdoor facilities are poorly maintained, others only provide space for seasonal activities like football, not that kind of football, or soccer, not that kind of soccer. They become fairly or totally useless in winter given the blankness that they offer. The lack of physical activities, the lack of adequate public spaces leads to mental health concerns and a severe lack of connection with nature as well as educational opportunities and purposes. Children are becoming less happy due to the feeling of being imprisoned with little freedom in mobility. This explains why high school students often become so excited once they got their driver's license because they finally gained the freedom they were looking for in the first 16 years or so of their lives. 
learning opportunities about nature are also restricted when youths don't have access in their neighborhoods to learn about tree types, the importance of vegetables and nutrition through public gardens, and parents don't have time to drive them to conservation areas that are distant from their homes. All in all, car dependent suburbia hindered the growth of our children and future generations to come. But not all hope is lost. Cities are starting to adopt policies, guidelines, and designs to preserve natural areas within the urban space and become more inclusive and accessible for children with a range of opportunities and new infrastructures. This is the Milwasan Trail in Saskatoon. It allows access to the South Saskatchewan River's waterfront throughout the city and allows its users to learn about the city's history and nature, from the beaver population to tall grass prairie and the swales. Playgrounds and parks are also becoming more inclusive, and one great example of that is from my friend Humane Cities from Calgary. Spoiler alert, he's jumping into my video right now. When I was a kid, playgrounds had rocks. Lots of playgrounds still have rocks. And then they started changing to this rubbery stuff. I didn't really understand the need for this. As an adult, though, I realized the benefit this is to people using wheelchairs or other mobility aids. Last year, while perusing the City of Calgary's Instagram page, I noticed they'd opened a bunch of what they call inclusive playgrounds. To quote from Calgary.ca, Inclusive playgrounds are meant to be engaging, fun spaces where everyone can play regardless of their abilities. These playgrounds challenge the most active children while also providing enclosed areas for quiet and creative play. These playgrounds feature braille, ramps, accessible swings, instructions for American Sign Language, and musical instruments. Each playground hosts a variety of activities, which are listed on the website. Right now, there are 10 inclusive playgrounds around the city, with the goal of having one within 5 kilometers of every Calgarian. I'd love to see this sort of playground become the standard, as right now, there are still playgrounds being built hostile to people using wheels, like this one with a mulch base. Obviously, not everything will be built for everyone, but hopefully we can set a standard of inclusive play. Playgrounds are just one type of park in cities. If you'd like to come on a bit of a tour of some natural parks, join me over on the Humane Cities YouTube channel. Thanks, Alex. Everybody, you guys should check out Alex's video about natural parks, link in the description or somewhere on the corner of the screen. Public spaces, natural or human created, are extremely important to foster the development of children. The like of parks, natural areas, and all season facilities have led to the huge decrease in physical activities as well as some raising mental health concerns among children for generations. This will ultimately lead to future issues about public health as these generations grow up but we can change this environment for our children and the future generations, which fulfills the goal of creating a better living environment and improving their future and living quality. Healthy cities will raise healthy children and eventually create healthy future for all of us. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.